be telling you a little bit about understanding the Earth, uh, machine learning, and then uh, a relatively new little tool called Kuplo Pipelines. I'm Kyle Story, a computer vision engineer at Descartes Labs, and my co-presenter. Hi, hi, I'm Faustine Lee. I'm also a computer vision engineer. And with that, let's get started. So we're going to run through a lot of things during this talk. The three key points that we hope that you can walk away from this room remembering are that in the, do the domain that we work in, satellite imagery, there's an uh, incredibly large amount and a growing amount of satellite imagery, and it provides a very powerful way of understanding the world around us. Second, uh, machine learning is a very powerful technique for, under for processing and understanding these satellite imagery, uh, but it presents unique challenges in this domain. And third, we are using a, a array of tools within the uh, Google Cloud Suite to be able to uh, understand these imagery, provide value for our customers. And in particular, we've been exploring Kuflo pipelines, and we'd like to tell you a little bit about that today. So what do you think of when uh, you think of the Earth? What do you picture? Perhaps it's this uh, iconic picture from the Apollo space mission uh, almost 50 years ago at this point, a blue dot out in space. Well, oh, since that time, technology has allowed satellite in satellites to take an increasingly large amount of data covering our globe through a, a wide variety of spectrums and uh, over a, a regular time interval. And what Descartes Labs, we're in the business of taking that massive amount of data using the Google Cloud uh, as a backbone and processing that into valuable information and decisions that our customers can make. So in the, just to give you a sense of what we can do with satellite imagery, for example, in this picture, on the left hand, we have used a particular combination of spectral bands that pull out vegetation, allow us to understand crops, crop development. In the center, this, uh, the synthetic aperture radar band allows us to understand built infrastructure or mines and minerals in the, uh, further to the right. And finally, high resolution satellite imagery allowing us to study and understand, in this case, uh, oil and gas infrastructure. These are fracking installations. Outside of the um, of active sensors and the visible bands, there are all, sorry, sorry, passive sensors. There are also active sensors. For example, here are synthetic aperture radar. So this is actually a satellite that's flying over, sending down a radar signal, receiving the reflected signal, and so that allows us to both see the reflections off of metal structures, or you can see all the boats flowing into this harbor, and also learn about 3D information uh, in uh, in this picture. So that all is to say that there's an incredible amount of data that's being produced all the time from satellites and other sources. That data gives us a really valuable picture for understanding the world around us and driving actual insights. This is a picture that was taken by the Sentinel satellite shortly after the campfire erupted in Northern California in November. Uh, you can see the plumes of smoke coming off of the, the place where the fire is burning. And by looking into different, uh, spectral, you know, different spectral wavelengths than our eye can see, we can actually pick out where the fire is actively burning. This is a shortwave infrared and a near-infrared false color image. We can see where the fire is, act is actually actively burning in this case. And so by using satellite imagery, that allows us to really understand what's going on in our world in, uh, in a very powerful way. What's important then is turning that massive amount of data into decisions or understanding that our customers can use. So here is an image of crop fields over uh, in, in um, center of uh, the United States in Nebraska. And we've built out a pipeline that allows us to predict the amount of corn and soy that are produced in a given growing season. And then that helps our customers, in particular cargo, be able to understand how they move grain around and then what they can expect for prices in the agriculture market. As I mentioned earlier on, we find that computer vision and machine learning is a very powerful way of understanding these data sets and being able, able to produce insights at scale. Uh, and that's, why, uh, the remain that's what the remainder of this talk will largely focus on. So within, uh, within satellite imagery and computer vision, we think about uh, these along three axes, detect, map, and monitor. So detect is finding, using computer vision and machine learning to be able to find infrastructure, find the points of interest, the things that you're interested in all around the globe. 
um, ma you know, mapping those across, so mapping those across the globe in uh, the different regions of interest that you're interested in. And then finally, being able to monitor those in real time, being able to understand changes, and then use that to drive your business. So for an example of detection, we've built a computer vision algorithm that can uh, detect wind turbines, and we can now run this anywhere in the world. We're able to use Google Cloud to map all the wind turbines in the United States overnight. Mapping, so this is a convolutional neural net that uh, maps out the footprints of buildings in high res resolution satellite imagery. You can see the satellite imagery on the left and then the output of this neural net algorithm in the middle and on the right. And then finally, monitoring change over time. So this is a pixel-based random forest algorithm that uses the spectral information in the, from the Sentinel satellite to be able to make a mass of where water is at any time. And what you're seeing here is running that over sequential time slices of satellite imagery, and you're seeing this reservoir in Northern California dry up during the, the drought of the previous few years. So with that, I'd like to hand over the rest of the presentation to my co-presenter, Faustine, to dig into all the things that I've been presenting in a little more detail. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so I want to preface my part of the talk by saying we're not really all that interested in digging into the algorithms behind our models. If you're interested in domain-specific algorithms, Kyle gave a great talk at last year's Next. Um, but for this talk, what we found as scientists was that we really couldn't treat the model as a black box, even though we really wanted to. Um, that data goes in and answers come out. Well, what happens to the data and how does it arrive in our model? And what do we do with the outputs where do we store it and so forth. So what we found was that we should focus on our workflows and how to streamline those. So let me step through this. So there's a lot of things that happen after the imagery comes off of the satellite. We have a great ingest team that ingests data into our platform that we built on top of Google Cloud. But of course, imagery is completely useless if we can't access it, so we host microservices that allow scientists to programmatically query and access imagery. And we um, interact with those microservices using our Descartes Labs Python library. Once we have training data, we, it's time to train our model, and we build convolutional neural networks in TensorFlow. And we heavily leverage Google Compute Engine to train our models, and we found that deep learning VMs are really fast to get us started. But of course, now that we're ready with our model, it's time to deploy. And for large geospatial applications, that often means inference over multiple regions of interest. We actually have a task system that we built um, and host, and that allows us to scale out our models by 100 or 1,000 times. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in depth later. So to dive in a little bit deeper, I don't want to belabor the point, but our imagery is not just pixels. In fact, it has a lot of earth science related to it. And so prior to analysis, we have to geo-register and co-locate all, all of our imagery. And we also have to care about things like atmospheric reflectance or whether clouds are obscuring our objects of interest. Once our imagery is analytics ready, we have to access it. And because our data platform holds large multimodal data sets, we have APIs that make it really easy to access. So in four lines of Python code, we get imagery over New Mexico almost instantaneously. And this is really great for developers because it means that if I want imagery over a different satellite, I just change one line of code. Um, but deployment is where it gets tricky. Um, often we might want every square kilometer of a, of a large region of interest like the United States. So how do we do this? We have a task system that we built that allows us to scale these highly elastic workflows. Um, and the way we do it is we have a client that creates tiles over the earth of arbitrary size and each tile is, has a hash associated with it. We have a deployment script that 
knows how to instantiate a model, how to predict, how to pre-process and post-process that data. And we feed it into our tasks API, and that all runs in Kubernetes. So the Earth is massively parallelizable. All you have to do is chip it into um, non-overlapping tiles, and each tile goes into a separate Docker container. And this leverages all the really nice things about Kubernetes, like auto-scaling, CPU and GPU node pools, things like that. But we want our results back, and so we host a catalog API. Um, we're populating those APIs, uh, that REST endpoint, as we go, um, asynchronously. So at the end, you get a map of the Earth with your inference on top of it. So why are we using Kubeflow? Well, conceptually, machine learning pipelines are pretty straightforward. We get data, we train a model, and then we deploy. Uh, but we found that really that's not the case, and um, research projects become quickly unmaintainable. And I didn't really talk about model training because it's probably the least inspiring part of what we do as scientists. Uh, currently, we sort of manage our own VM infrastructure. We have to manage our G own GPUs. We have to make sure that CUDA is properly installed and so on. And we spend a lot of time debugging things like this instead of focusing on the science. And that's not what, really, what we really want. And this is a really awesome uh, thing, this task system, but the deploy script is pretty monolithic and hard to maintain, and we really want um, to be able to have componentize our deployments. So with those pain, pain, pain points and many more, um, like for example, we had difficulties with managing uh, the training environment versus the deployment environment, and we had ran into hard to debug bug bugs with that. Um, Kubeflow pipelines seemed like a great option for us. It was immediately attractive because the main points of Kubeflow are things that we are running into and we want to solve internally. So what is Kubeflow pipelines? It is a machine learning workflow that work, uh, machine learning system that manages machine learning workflows on Kubernetes. And it aims to make machine learning reusable and reproducible and takes a product, a machine learning product, all the way from experimentation to deployment. And of course, it runs natively on Kubernetes, which is great because all of our infrastructure runs on the cloud, on Kubernetes, and it works really well with our APIs. So specifically about pipelines, uh, the core unit of work in pipelines is a operation or component, and they all run in a Docker container. And each component has an output in input, and we do uh, graph inference, so it's a directic acyclic graph of work, um, and it leverages all the wonderful things about Kubernetes, like um, auto-scaling, um, metrics and so on. So this is kind of what a pipeline looks like. It's basically a Python function with operations inside. And we know that this is a pipeline because we add a little decorator that says DSL pipeline. And all this pipeline does is it downloads a text file from the Google bucket and prints it out. And I'll show you this later in the demo. It says, hello Google, next. Okay, so here's the fun part. Uh, I wrote a end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline in Kubeflow, and I'm gonna demo it really soon, but the application will be detecting oil and gas sites in the Permian Basin. Uh, these are what they look like. They're called well pads. Um, if you don't know what a well pad is, it's basically a large concrete rectangle that they put uh, equipment on while they're drilling for oil and gas. And we might be interested in looking for these because uh, you know, we might be interested in monitoring where fracking activity is or um, by seeing where they're being built, we can uh, tell, like, monitor our energy infrastructure. So we want to turn this into this. So how do we do that? Well, thankfully, I wrote a end-to-end -end, um, pipeline that in Kubeflow. So it goes from pulling the imagery from our platform 
from just uh, simple labels to deploying on our test system and seeing the output. Okay, so um, when the demo is running, you'll be able to see that this pipeline does both training and deployment. Um, and there's some things that we really like about pipelines. So for example, um, each component runs its own Docker container, which means that we can encapsulate the environment that we're working on it and we really can control uh, the very specific packages that we put in it. So we can make sure that our training and deployment environments always match. And because each component is containerized, we can mix and match components. So it promotes reuse. And there's some neat things about pipelines that um, I hope to show you. So uh, they have native TensorBoard integration, which is really great because you can inspect when you're expect how your model's performing and you can compare different runs. So it really supports the experimentation side of model building. And there's some great things about deploying with pipelines. So um, it leverages all the Kubernetes infrastructure that we have in-house. Um, it interops well with the tools that we use. So um, we heavily use Stackdriver and Istio and um, Spinnaker. So all those things work with Kubeflow. And um, managing identities and um, different like workflows with different scientists is really easy with um, Kubernetes like, uh, or like Google Cloud and Kubernetes authentication. And I didn't really mention this, this is not the focus of this talk, but what we really found great was that Kubeflow pipelines are a first class citizen in AI hub. And it's a problem internally where we get, we onboard new scientists and we want to get them up to speed. And how do we do that? Well, Previously, we had to point them to a GitHub repo and say, install these packages, run this code. And it's really awesome to be able to point to somebody um, in AI Hub and say, download this pipeline, run it in this cluster. And it's very, very straightforward now. Okay, well, um, I guess I will close off this talk. Um, the demo's not working. Uh, and contextualize what we're trying to do in the, oh, well, the demo is working. <laughs> so I will actually show you this because this is really awesome. Okay, so this is the UI for Kubeflow pipelines, and this is that Hello World pipeline that I just showed you from before, and it's just, it's as easy as clicking run. Um, so let's call this run hello. We'll click start. It takes a couple seconds for Kubernetes to schedule some, uh, some pods, but it should show up very, very briefly. There we go, it's running. Looks like that completed, so let's refresh. Hello, Google Cloud Next. Um, but you know, that's not really what we're here for. We're here for machine learning workflows. And this is that oil and well pads demo I talked about earlier. So it's basically just as easy as the last one. Um, let's call this demo. I can add a description. Um, I can add it to an experiment. Let's not do that. There's some parameters that I can set on the fly. Um, and then I can click start and it's on its way. So the idea behind Kubeflow is that machine learning should be as, machine learning should be as pain, painless as possible and previously, there wasn't really great tools. Um, like TensorFlow democratized training models, but really training is only a small part of 
uh, the whole machine learning work, workflow and cycle. In fact, train model is just one, uh, one operation of this multi-step um, pipeline. All right, so let's check on what our model is doing. Awesome. So these schemas basically are JSON parameter files that tell each operation certain characteristics about the data, like which satellite it should pull from, um, what date range it should look for, things like that. And that's all we provide to our pipeline. Um, right now, it's actually pulling imagery live from our Descartes Labs platform, and you can see it streaming now. Um, and this just goes to show how fast our data access is. Um, if you were to try and do geospatial analysis 20 years ago, you would have to work with these very bespoke and oftentimes slow um, interfaces. Okay, well, Training image is completed. Um, it pushed it to a Google bucket, so let's check that out. Here we go. So our V2 images are in this bucket. Um, we can scroll around and look at that. Um, so very briefly, the machine learning algorithm that we're using to train our um, oil and well pad detector is uh, what we call coarse segmentation. So the input images look like this. So this is a well pad. And the target images look like this. So it's a binary image where the ones are where the well pads are. And you notice that it's much, much smaller than the original target image. And that's because for um, simple shapes like these well pads, you don't really need that high of fidelity. And because the target image is really small, these models train much faster. And you see you'll get pretty good results with a limited amount of data and a limited amount of epochs to train. So let's check in on our pip pipeline. It will update on the fly. So it looks like it's training our model right now. Uh, what we did was we pulled imagery down from what we've created in previous steps, and it looks like it's on epoch form. And the great thing about pipelines is that um, this step is training on the GPU, um, and as long as we have GPU nodes available, uh, Kubeflow will schedule them. And what's really great is that um, Upgrading your GPUs to TPUs is just as transparent as adding TPU nodes to your node pools. So this should be done in a couple minutes. We're on Epoch 7. So while that's training, I can show you very briefly what our labels look like. So this is our base satellite imagery, and these are our labels. We don't have a whole lot of them, um, but we found that uh, these core segmentation, segmentation models train pretty quickly. And let's, we can zoom in on and take a look at some of these well pads. Uh, so this is 60 centimeter imagery over NAEP. NAEP is a, from the Nagro, National Agricultural Program. Um, so a lot of this imagery is ostensibly for um, like agriculture research. Uh, so kind of zoomed in on the well pad. You can kind of see that there's um, a little dark spot on the center of these. That's where they put the um, well, when they put the pump jack to pump the oil out. Okay, so I think that our training should be close to done. Yeah, it looks like it's saving the model. Takes 
a little while to upload. Good. Here we go. So let's take a look here. And we can see that it saved our model weights in the cloud. And if we go back, we can see that uh, this metrics panel is done. So let's take a look at that. And we can open up TensorBoard right from Kubeflow pipelines. So that's great. We see that our loss went down over time. And it just launched our catalog endpoint. That's where we store our data. And now it's launching our task system. So this will do the uh, actual inference. So our task takes a little while to start up. Um, and that's just um, loading a task controller, making sure that our deploy script's in there, um, distributed to the worker nodes. And it takes a little bit of time to spin up, uh, um, like to get the resources. Uh, so we can see that our tasks are pending now. Uh, once that's done, it should start the inference job and it should be pretty fast. Yeah, so the, our TensorBoard logs are available here. If they're mul multiple in one file, um, you can like compare the runs and things like that. Okay, so our task system says it started and we can look at our um, task monitor and see that it is indeed running. So, it's already scheduling work on these nodes, and look, we already have 127 active workers, and it's already succeeding. So as soon as this is done, we can look at the outputs. And it's going really, really fast. <laughs> okay, so that is completed, and Kubeflow should think that that's completed very soon. All right, awesome. So now this task, this component is just pulling down imagery from our catalog product. That's where we deployed our uh, model over and where we store our results. And this should be very quick too. So yeah. And then once this is done, we can look at our final results. So yeah, this is incredibly powerful. We just took a, a computer vision model from no data to deployed in less than 10 minutes. And it's completely reproducible with Kubeflow pipelines. All right, awesome, this is done. Um, another neat thing about Kubeflow is that you can embed arbitrary HTML assets. So here we go, we can see our, a tile of what we predicted and the results. So let's take a look at our product. And this is also in viewer. And let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, so <clears throat> this is our deployed computer vision model. Uh, I can overlay the base imagery, so let me do that. and then we can compare them. So it didn't, it didn't train with a whole lot of data and it didn't train with a whole lot of epochs, but it looks like it did learn something. Um, and you know, it's really easy to start the loop back over again, add more data, retrain, try different models, because we've really reduced that um, developer cycle um, real exponentially with Kubeflow pipelines. 
Awesome, so that was the demo. Um, we can go back to the slides. Maybe. Okay, so I wanna contextualize I want to wrap up this talk and contextualize what we're doing in the, in the scale of the science that we're doing. And of course, everybody likes pretty pictures. So these are projects that we've actually deployed to scale. Um, so for example, this is all the trees in um, New York City mapped. And if you're interested in looking at trees, um, this visualization was done by our awesome creative marketing guy, Tim Wallace. He has a great Medium article available, and in principle, we could map all the trees in the United States. And of course, this is really useful because we can monitor where deforestation and reforestation is happening. Um, for something a little bit different, this is a global NO2 map. So nitrogen dioxide is a, a byproduct of combustion. And so this map is really telling us where pollution is happening. Um, you can see hot spots of where there's like coal burning, for example, and the hot spot in South Central Africa is they do periodic veg vegetation burning. So this is something that you normally can't see with the naked eye, but it becomes very visible with certain sensors. Uh, so polluters beware, we can see you. Um, and this project shows some of the turnaround and um, agility that we have at Descartes Labs. So. These are hundreds of thousands of buildings over a region in North Carolina. And this was done overnight ahead of Hurricane Florence so that we could sort of monitor and predict um, what, how many buildings were at risk. Uh, just to wrap up, um, we have a lot of exciting science at Descartes Labs, um, mostly related to the geospatial domain. And Kubeflow Pipelines is a great resource for us because it allows us to handle the scale and scope of our projects. Uh, Kubeflow also works really great with the tools we already built on Google Cloud, and it's becoming better and better. Um, it's an open source project. You're, everybody is free to st support and contribute to it, and there's a lively community already. So here's a little bit of information on how to get started with Kubeflow, and here's a little bit of information about us. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your participation. Um, that's the end of our talk.